it's my privilege to welcome you here today as we prepare our hearts. Let's look to the Lord as we always do. Heavenly Father, we thank you today to sing, Fairest Lord Jesus, the Lord of the nations, the Son of God and the Son of Man. Yes, Lord Jesus, it is you we want to cherish. It is you we want to honor. And I pray today, committing this time to you, as we open up your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit will take over, controlling every thought, every action of my heart and mind, and that you speak through me to glorify your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray these things as I submit and surrender myself to the authority of your Holy Spirit. Be glorified, and we pray all these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, in the second part of our overview of the book of Malachi, we learned the following from the personal history of the prophet Malachi. Nothing is known about the personal history and circumstances of this man. But we learn the following lessons. But from his life, we learn and ministry, we learn that he was a humble servant of Yahweh. Second, he was a man whose heart was set on honoring God. Third, he was an honest messenger of Yahweh. Fourth, he had a holy reverence for God. And we'll see that when we get into our verse by verse study. He was a man whose hope is in Yahweh alone setting a wonderful example for each one of us today. We need to have our hope alone in God because wherever else we put our hope, we will be disappointed. The only person who cannot disappoint us is Almighty God. We also examined the reasons for Malachi's proper place in the canon of Scripture. In other words, why do we have Malachi in the book of of the 66 books of the Bible. Well, four clear, concise, compelling, and cogent reasons were given to show that Malachi, a book of only 55 verses, deserves a unique place among the 66 books, books of the Holy Bible given to mankind by a holy and blessed God of the Bible. First, it was written to confront the spirit of complacency, compromise, corruption, and carelessness that had developed among the Jewish returnees. And we are going to see that spirit of conf the confrontation that Malachi will have with the priests and the people. Second, it was written to correct the abuses which were rampant among God's people. Third, it was written to call God's people back to the godly ways of their forefathers. Fourth, it was written to comfort the godly remnant in Judah. And fifth, it was written to caution God's people and the wicked of the coming of the great day and the great and dreadful day of the Lord. We also identified the preeminent passage of verse in the book of Malachi. Three verses were selected as surpassing all others, namely Malachi chapter 1, verse 2a, because it affirms God's love for his people. And then chapter 2, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, because it announces the coming of the Messiah. And then third, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, because it assures us of the unchanging character of God. Because there God says, I, the Lord, do not change. Now, our overview of Malachi brings us to the 10th major point, which is a favorite of mine in preaching and proclaiming the lasting and life-changing truths of the Word of God. So we have now come to the discussion of the what? The prominent doctrines taught or illustrated in the book of Malachi. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, the Bible cogently and clearly speaks of the divine purpose of Scripture. It says, all Scripture 
is inspired by God and is profitable or useful or beneficial for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Also in Romans chapter 15 verse 4, the Bible spurs us God's goal for preserving his word for us. And what is that goal? In Romans chapter 15 verse 4, the Bible says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So when the Bible was written, it was written with you and me in mind that it will instruct us. Then also in First, uh, First Corinthians chapter, chapter ten, verse eleven, the Bible gives us the purpose of what was written in the past. It says, "Now these things happened to them, referring to the children of Israel, as an example." And they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the age of the ages have come. So, God's word, the Bible is telling us, is preserved for the specific purpose of profitably instructing God's believing, believing people in God's truth. So, an important question to ask at this juncture is. What profitable or useful or beneficial teachings are taught or illustrated in the book of Malachi for believers to know and diligently put into practice through the power of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us? While well, following the example of the preacher, I have arranged the prominent doctrines in these delightful words. The preacher in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9 to, to 10, talks about the duty of the preacher, how he was supposed to carefully arrange words in delightful ways so that when he presents his truth, it will be so sweet to the ears to hear and so warm for the heart to receive. So the first prominent so I arranged, we are going to learn 12 prominent doctrines taught in the book of Malachi. And I'll quickly present them to you because, as I said, this is the foundation. We are laying a foundation for our verse-by-verse -verse study of Malachi. So once you have this foundation, you'll be on sound footing as we proceed in our verse-by-verse -verse study. The first prominent doctrine of Malachi is sentenced on the person of God. Malachi powerfully presents to us that the one and only true God of the universe is a real personal divine being. Please take note of this. In our study of Malachi, we will be encountering, listen carefully, a real personal divine being who has been reverently and repeatedly referred to us the Lord, or Yahweh in the Hebrew, or the Lord of hosts, or if you have the NIV says the Lord Almighty, Yahweh Sabaoth. As a personal divine being, Malachi also reveals Yahweh to us by his majestic and marvelous names such as Elohim, Adonai, Malak Gadu, that is a great king. As a divine person, we will see that he corrects his wayward people. If he is not a person, he cannot correct people when they are going wrong. But we will see that God will be correcting his people in Malachi. As a divine person, he calls his wayward people to return to him. He comforts his godly remnant. And then he confirms his love for his people. In other words, the eternal God is personal. So please, as we study Malachi from this point on, repeatedly ask the Holy Spirit, 
living on the inside of you to make known to you more of God as a real person to reason with. If you have questions, you can ask God. You can reason with God to relate to, to rely on, to revere, and to return to when you have gone astray from, from him. Actually, reference is made to the three distinct persons in the Godhead in Malachi. The Lord refers to God the Father. Then Christ, God the Son, is prophesied as the messenger of the covenant who will purify the priests and people. We'll see that soon. And then he's also described as the son of righteousness who brings healing to his people. And then God the Spirit is also referred to once in this book of Malachi in chapter 2 verse 15. While the second prominent teaching vividly illustrated in the book of Malachi is the preservation of God. Malachi was originally, listen carefully, written to a people preserved by Yahweh. Although God had permitted the people of Judah and Jerusalem to be exiled from their homeland, that is the promised land, God preserved a remnant of them and brought them back to the land of, the land of Israel, the land that he promised to give to their forefathers. In fact, God's preservation of a remnant of Israel throughout all the ages is a powerful proof for the existence of God. Do you want to know if God is existing? Look at the nation of Israel. They have no reason to be existing on the planet Earth. But because God promised that they cannot be destroyed from this planet, if you can cancel the decree for the sun not to rise tomorrow, then Israel will not be existing. If any man can do that, God says, if any man can do that, then Israel will not be existing. But he preserved them. So, you see, from the days of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, through the days of Haman, and then Hitler, to the days of Hamas and Hezbollah today, the people of Israel had faced, and are still facing, the threat of annihilation. Some people want to wipe them off. The map. Well, if there is no God who is able to preserve them, then that will have happened. But let's take heart, my friends and fellow believers. Yahweh is still on his throne. He has pre he had preserved and is still preserving Israel. That is why we have the nation Israel today. It's not because the Jews are smart. It's because God, Almighty God, has chosen to preserve them and they will be preserved until his purpose is fully accomplished for them. Malachi wants us to know that that is why he begins to know that, to know that, that is why he begins his message by saying the oracle of the word of the Lord to who? To Israel. If Israel had been destroyed, that message would have been sent to Nobody. Well, the third prominent doctrine clearly taught in Malachi is the doctrine of the people of God. Malachi teaches us that there is a people of God through whom God accomplishes his divine purposes. Malachi emphasizes the doctrine of the people of God by first referring to them as Israel. He begins the, the, the teaching about the people of Israel by saying this message is for the people of Israel, to Israel. He describes them as a people whom all the nations will call blessed. Today, not many nations are calling Israel blessed. But just mark my words, when Israel begins to walk with God, all the nations will call them blessed. He also describes them as people whom God has created. Just as God created Israel, he created you and I. He also describes some of them as those who feared the Lord. Then he speaks of them as those who are from the tents of Jacob. 
to distinguish them from the descendants of Esau. We are going to see two people, the, pe the tens people of the tens of Jacob and the descendants of Esau. Actually, he speaks also of the tents, the people from the tents of Jacob as the sons of Jacob. So the question is, are you one of God's people? Please understand that you do not have to be an Israelite or a Jew to be called a people of God today. How are we called a people of God today? Well, it's through faith in Jesus Christ you can become one of God's people, saved and set apart for God's purposes in this present life and in the life soon to come. The fourth prominent teaching solemnly presented in Malachi is the doctrine of the punishment of God. In fact, the punishment of God vividly, is vividly taught not only at the beginning of Malachi, but also at the end of it. Setting forth the doctrine of the punishment of God, the prophet Malachi prophesied God's punishment of Edom. He says, They may build, but I will tear down. And men will call them a the, 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 uh, the land of the wicked territory. Uh, the, uh, how, he, how, how did he spell it? It said, men will call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. The Hebrew word for indignant, za'am, also means to punish. The wicked people of Edom who haven't repented, even though God has given them opportunity upon opportunity to repent, experience the punishment of God. And then at the end of Malachi, the prophet once again speaks of the punishment of God in a rather dramatic and dreadful manner. In chapter 4, verse 1, he says, For behold, that is a dramatic manner of introducing this doctrine of the punishment of God. The day is coming, burning like a furnace. And all the arrogant, notice the people God is punishing. He's not punishing people who love him, who obey him. Notice the people he's punishing. And all the arrogant and every evil doer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. That is total destruction. Then in verse 5, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So the doctrine of the punishment of God is taught both at the beginning of Malachi and at the end of it. I know that the doctrine of the punishment of God is not a popular subject today among our modern society, but please let's make no mistake about this. As long as there are wicked, evil doers who have rejected God's call to turn from their wickedness and evil doing, you can rest assured that God will punish them at his appointed time. Now the fifth prominent doctrine convincingly taught in Malachi is the doctrine of the peace of God. I like that. You see, the book of Malachi gives us a balanced view of who God is. He's not only a God who punishes the wicked, but he's also a God whose peace abides with those who revere him. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, we see that revealed so clearly to us. The Bible says in chapter 5, chapter 2, verse 5, My covenant with him was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him as an object of reverence, so he re revered me, speaking about Le Levi, and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He, he walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many back from iniquity. How wonderful. You see, the God of peace wants his people to walk with him in peace. 
God is not at war with anyone who wants to walk with him in peace. That was his desire for Israel from the days he established his covenant with them. And may I say to us, that is God's desire for you and me today. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom, which you all know here. Shalom. It is an important word in the Bible. It also means war, whole, welfare, safe, secure, sound. It expresses completeness, harmony, and fulfillment. Please listen, the only true source of peace is God. The Bible says Christ is our peace. And remember the popular saying, no, no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. Jesus is the source of our peace and the giver of our peace. And Malachi has that message in his book. Well, the sixth prominent doctrine confidently taught in Malachi is the doctrine of the prophecy of God. We've already learned that Malachi is about, is, a, is what? It's a prophetic message from God to the people of Israel living in Judah 100 years after the Babylonian exile to alert us that his message is indeed a prophetic message. Malachi begins his message by saying the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Also to emphasize the doctrine of the prophecy of God, Malachi uses several popular prophetic expressions such as, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ko Amar Yahweh, declares the Lord, Neum Yahweh, says the Lord of hosts, Amar Yahweh Sebaot, says the Lord God of Israel, Amar Yahweh Elohe Israel. In fact, Malachi contains prophecies that have already been fulfilled, such as sending my messenger or Elijah the prophet referring to John the Baptist. That has come and has been fulfilled. And then there is also the, the, the prophecy fulfilled about Jesus, the messenger of the covenant, that has also been fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus. But other prophecies are yet to be fulfilled, especially the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That is a prophecy we are waiting for. Well, the seventh prominent teaching in Malachi is the doctrine of the promise of God. The Christian life rests on the foundation of God's promises for today and for the future. If God has not made promises to us, our life as Christians will be the most pitiful one, lives. But God, knowing that we need promises, loaded the Bible with promises after promises. Time will not allow me to bring to your attention all the promises God has made to his people in Malachi. But please let me share just one or, one or two with you. In calling his people to repentance, God makes this blessed promise, which have delighted the hearts of God's people throughout the ages. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 to 11. The Bible says this, shares this promise with God's people. It says, verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and trust me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Normally God doesn't ask people to trust him because that may be evil. But in this particular case, it says, test me, test me, test me. Now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. 
Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. And these promises in Malachi are so special. They are so sweet. Because God is asking his people to trust him, and if they trust him, he will do something. He will bless them beyond belief. And many people have taken God at this word and have seen the, the blessings of God pour out into their lives beyond belief. So please, when, we, when you read and study your Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to impress the promises of God upon your heart. That way, you will not be robbed of the rich promises of God to you. One of the things I do when I study my Bible in the morning, when I wake up, God gives me life. Um, sometimes I write the promise of the day. Today I was in uh, Colossians. And the promise of the day, let me see if I can uh, point to it. The promise of the day was, uh, let me, is that? it talks about whatever you do, do your work heartily, ask for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. So it's, whatever I do, including my preaching, God says, as I do it heartily, as to him, there is a reward, a reward that he will give. Blessed be his name. So, Dr. Charles Stanley writes about the promise of God. He says, listen carefully to this. He says, a promise is valuable if only the one making it has a trustworthy character and the ability to carry through, to carry through. Our Heavenly Father is truthful, faithful, loving, and all-powerful. We can base our entire life on his promises, secure in the knowledge that he will do just as he has said. See, God's promises are not promises of men that is made today and tomorrow is broken. <laughs> I've made promises to people and I've I've not been able to keep those promises. But never will that happen with God. He keeps every promise. And that is why today this world is like it is. Because one of his promises he made to the world after destroying the world with flood, he says, I will never again destroy this world with what? Flood. And has it happened? Or some places get flood, but not the whole world. God has kept his word, his word to the whole world. He has not destroyed the whole world again by flood. But he promised that it will be destroyed by fire in the last days. What the eighth prominent teaching concisely presented in Malachi is the possession of God. Malachi didn't use a lot of words to teach us the doctrine of the possession of God. But he uses the two most important words to teach us this doctrine, namely mine. When you think of possession, you think of what? Mine. <laughs> My own possession. Those are the two major words God used to teach us the doctrine of the possession of God. Speaking about the godly remnant in the nation of Judah who revere him, Yahweh blessedly describes them as mine, my valued possession. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 17, this is what the Bible says of the doctrine of the possession of God. It says, they will be mine. Speaking about the godly remnant. How wonderful for God to say, you will be mine. 
says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. What a blessing to be called my own possession, my special treasure. You see, God is the possessor of all things. He possesses the things in the heavens and on the earth and in the seas. But do you know that God's most valuable possession is his people. His people. It is the people who revere him and esteem his name in their lives. They are God's possession. The question is, will God say of you and me today that you are mine? You are my valued possession. And I'm thankful that he can say that to us because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, the ninth prominent doctrine clearly taught in Malachi is the purity of God. Malachi teaches us that because of the purity of God, he demands that his people offer sacrifices that are not worthless, but offering that, that is pure, pure. In Malachi chapter 1 verse 11, he will speak to us about the purity of God. The Bible says in verse 11, it says, For from the rising of the sun, even to his setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going, is going to be offered to my name. And a great offering that is pure, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. God wants what? Pure offerings to be presented to him. Not only that, because of the purity of God, that is precisely why when the messenger of the covenant appears, his first order of business is to refine and purify his people so that they can present offerings that honor his purity. In chapter 3, verse 2 to, to 3, we read the message of the messenger of the covenant. The Bible says, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears, for he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. So please don't make the mistake of thinking that purity or holiness is not important to God. It is deeply, deeply important to Him. That is why God will not leave us in our sins to rot. But as His children, God will do everything in His power to purify us. The question is, is the purity of God important to you as it is to God? Do you accept the purifying work of God in your life in order for you to present offerings that are pleasing to him? Well, the tenth prominent doctrine convincingly taught in Malachi is the doctrine of the pleasure of God. Do you know God has pleasure? It's not you alone who has pleasure. God has pleasure also. Malachi begins presenting the doctrine of the pleasure of God in a very striking manner to make a very deep and lasting impression on the people of Judah. In chapter 1, verse 8, he says, he asks the people this question, or he states this fact. In verse 8, he says of chapter 1, But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Will he be pleased with you? There's the word, pleased. Or will he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts. So if the governor is not pleased, 
How much more will God not be pleased if people present offerings that are not fitting for him? Malachi says it will be a much more greater insult to offer blemished gifts to the governor of the universe. If an earthly governor is not pleased with such imperfect gifts, it will be a billion times not pleasing to Yahweh. He will not take pleasure in such offering. To drive home his teaching on the pleasure of God, Malachi uses words which no one, I don't want to hear God say to me. But he said it to the people of Malachi's day. In chapter 1 verse 10, listen to what he says to the people of Malachi's day. All that there will be one among you who will shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. Those are tough words to hear. The word used, Malachi uses for pleased signifies delight, desire, pleasure, or pursuit. Every one of us here would like God to say, I have pleasure in you, not I have no pleasure in you. Well, the people of Malachi's day heard this voice, I am not pleased with you, or I have no pleasure in you because of the compromise, complacency, and carelessness in the things of God. While the eighth prominent, the eleventh rather, the eleventh prominent doctrine concisely taught in Malachi is the preparation of God. Please let's not make the mistake of thinking that we are the only people who make preparations in life. <laughs> in fact, before we ever made God ever made God ever made we Oh, I guess, let me see. We ever made our first preparations in life. God has been at work making preparation, all kinds of preparations for us. Do you know that before he ever created you and I, God made preparations by making the heavens and the earth, the seas and the moon, the stars, the animals and the plants, some of which we have for food, also, the Lord Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to prepare a place for them. And after he's finished, he will come for them. So there's a preparation Jesus is doing for you and for me. That's something all journey born-again believers can look forward to. But Malachi, using few words, tells us that God is preparing something else. A day for dealing with wicked people. And that is found in Malachi chapter 4 verse 3. It says, You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day, listen carefully, which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. What a dreadful day awaiting the wicked who refuse to repent, who refuse to return to Jesus Christ. Please, as you see wickedness increase in our world today, take heart. Why? Well, the one and only true God of the universe has assured true believers in Jesus Christ that he's preparing a day on which to deal decisively with the wicked. In fact, it will be a day of great rejoicing for the believing people as they see perfect justice prevails. That will be a day. All wrongs will be right. God will make all wrongs right on that day is preparing to deal decisively with the wicked. Now finally, the greatest prominent doctrine concretely and convincingly taught in Malachi is the persistent love of God. In fact, this is the first prominent doctrine taught in Malachi, but I saved it for the last because it is always good to save the best for the last. <laughs> Malachi begins his prophecies, 
his prophetic message by reminding God's people of his persistent love for them. That is why he says in chapter 1 verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord. These are the most precious words in the book of Malachi. Why? Because they reveal Yahweh's persistent or continuing love for Israel in spite of their many sins that we will be looking at. And in spite of our many sins, God will continue to love you and to love me. Our overview, finally, our overview of Malachi now brings us to the presentation of the book's message from start to finish. What we are going to see in the presentation of the message in Malachi is that portions of Malachi are written in the format of a debate. So it's going to be a debating class for us at some point. Unlike any other book in the Bible, God first makes a statement of truth that is then denied by the people. God then refused the argument in great detail, restating and proving the truth of his original statement. Malachi also uses questions and answers freely to focus his accusations toward the priesthood as well as the people. So these features make Malachi one of the most argumentative books of the Bible. You are not going to see any book of the Bible where it's all, God asks a question, the people reply, denying it, and then God replies, it goes back and forth, back and forth. For three chapters, we'll see that combativeness, argumentativeness in the book of Malachi. Actually, in the Hebrew Bible, Malachi is the last of the 12 minor prophets. As such, it belongs to the composite book called the 12, that is the 12 minor prophets. There is no chapter 4 in the Hebrew Bible, as is the case in our English Bible. Chapter 4, verse 1 to 6, is in the Hebrew, is chapter 3, verse 9 to 24. That is how the Hebrew uh, divided the book. Well, the book can be divided into three divisions. The first division deals with uh, the privilege of the nation of Israel in chapter 1, verse 5, verse 1 to 5. As such, it begins with a communication, with communication of God to the nation of Israel, chapter 1, verse 1. Then the care of God for the nation, chapter 1, verse 2 to 5. The second division of Malachi focuses on the pollution of the nation of Israel. We will see that in chapter 1, verse 6 to chapter 3, verse 15. As such, it begins with the chief and characteristic sins of the nation of Israel. Chapter 1, verse 6 to 9, chapter 2, verse 9, will give us all the chief characteristic sins of Israel. The nation. In a bold and blunt fashion, fashion, the prophet Malachi wasted no time at all in spelling out the chief and characteristic sins of the nations, those sins which were bringing the wrath of God upon the nation's head. And I tell you, friends and fellow believers, if a nation is polluting, polluting herself with sins, Almighty God would not remain silent forever. At one point, God will raise up a prophet, a messenger, to spell out the chief and characteristic sins of that nation. And as I pondered this, I asked myself, what are the, the chief and characteristic sins of the United States today? You can ponder that, and I can ponder that. Well, after spelling out the chief and characteristic sins of the nation of Israel, the message of Malachi focuses on the condemnation of mixed marriages and frivolous divorces in chapter 2, verse 10 to 17. This is followed by the coming of the messenger of the Lord in chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. First, there is the messenger described as my messenger, referring to John the Baptist. Second, there is the messenger described as the messenger of the covenant, 
referring to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he is prophesied as the messenger who purified the priests and people alike. Then this is followed by the call to repentance, chapter 3, verse 7 to 12. You see that people were withholding God from God the tithes which had been commanded. That this was a robbing of God. But if the nation would bring back the tithes as it should, God would respond to his worship and pour upon the nation a blessing such as it could not contain. And in addition, other people would then look upon Israel as a truly blessed people of God, who God is ready to bless. So God is ready to bless us with abundance if we will put him first in our lives. Then the message in the second division of Malachi ends with the nation's challenge to the character of God in chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Malachi had to endure arrogant words spoken by the priest and the people, challenging the character of God and very critical of God. You see, when pollution abounds in a nation, the people become very critical of God, challenging even his impeccable character. That was what was happening in Malachi's day. Well, the third and final division of Malachi focuses on Yahweh's promises. We just talked about the promises of Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh's promises to the nation in chapter 3, verse 16 to 4 to 6. As such, it begins with a comforting promise of deliverance for the godly in chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. This is followed by the promise of the coming of the Messiah in chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Although the people of Israel are finally cured of idolatry after their return from Babylon, there is little spiritual progress in Israel's history. Sin abounds, and the need for the coming of the Messiah is greater than ever. And then the last promise to the nation announced by Malachi is the coming of Elijah in chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. The prophecy of Malachi closes with an exhortation to remember the law of Moses and with the announcement that Elijah will come before there appears the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And then the prophecy ends on the bitter word, curse. Do you know that the last word of the Bible in the Old Testament is the word curse? That is how the Old Testament ends. It ends on a bitter note, curse. Malachi leaves us with a feeling that the story is not yet finished, that God still has promises to fulfill on behalf of his people. After Malachi, after Malachi came 400 long years of silence, but when the time was right, heaven would burst forth in a song at the arrival of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now that we have, we have a bird's eye view of the prophetic book of Malachi and have a clear direction about what God has in store for us on our Bible bus journey, God willing, next week, we will begin, we will commence our verse-by-verse -verse expositional study of Malachi. And my earnest prayer for us is that as we search, study, and saturate ourselves with the lasting and life-changing truths purposefully preserved in Malachi for us, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Paracletos, the one who comes alongside to help us, will himself continue his divine and dependable, dependable work of teaching, training, and transforming each true born-again believer among us evermore into the glorious likeness of our glorious and great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Holy One of God, the healer and the head of the church. May the Spirit also use this study 
in Malachi to draw us closer to the Lord our God, to depend ever on Him, to delight in Him with a fresh and faithful longing for Him, and finally to be deliberate in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others whom God may bring our way so that they too will enter life which is in Jesus and begin to do what? To enjoy and experience the unchanging and unconditional love of God who so loved the world that the Bible says he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life, eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for helping us to lay down a foundation for our study in Malachi. I pray that you will begin to seal the things that you have taught us already and give us a fresh hunger to know you because you are a divine person to relate to, to revere, and to walk with. And I thank you so much for what you have in store for us. Help us to be ready to receive everything that you want us to receive, as well as to give, to share what you want us to share with others. Now, Lord, I pronounce your blessing upon your people. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the storm. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you.